So today is a big topic. And for those who don't know me yet, I'm Julie Bogart. I homeschooled my five children for 17 years. They are now all adults between the ages of 19 and 28. I consider them all successful adults. Even their adulthood has come with a journey and I have not given up the right to worry about my children, <laughs> even though they're competent adults. But what I do know is this, despite all the years of worry, despite things I genuinely regret, despite missteps and moments of terror, I really genuinely like my children, my adult children. And you know what? They genuinely like me. Not only do we love each other, but we like to be together. And to this day, we share information, articles, stories, podcasts, music, films, and poems with each other, because that is the culture that created my family. In fact, some of you might not know this, but every year at the end of the year, we celebrate solstice in addition to our usual Christmas tradition. This was a practice I started in 2009. And what we do at Solstice is sort of like a grown-up homeschool experience. I'll do a scope on this when we're closer to December. But basically what it is, is it's a chance for each of us to create handmade gifts and to share them with each other. And so often, what I see them produce and give is a direct reflection of what they got out of our homeschooling years together. It is one of the most satisfying and richest experiences I've ever had with my family. So we'll do a scope on solstice, but I share this with you before we start with regret because I created solstice as a way to repair some damage in my family. And I will share that with you today. Now, before we start, I want you to know this. I tell you the truth about my life. And I ask you to hold it gently. There are things that are challenging in each person's life and each person's homeschool. And sometimes we forget that when somebody walks through a hard time, what they deserve is kindness, not evaluation and not judgment. Now that doesn't mean you always agree with choices people make because we're humans and we do evaluate choices. But when you spend time with someone and they tell you a truth, I hope you can be gentle. I hope you can be kind and not assume that somebody's choice was just self-interested. These are important passages. And when we are working to create a community of homeschoolers who are so idealistic and so desiring for everything to turn out with a fairy tale ending, there's going to be carnage along the way. And we want to be the kinds of friends and support to those women, to those men, when they hit the skids, when the car hits the wall, okay? And then, you know, you can find good even in the math aftermath. And that's what I'm here to share today, okay? Thank you for all those amens and hugs and the support and for understanding what I'm sharing. Um, I think that sometimes we fall into pretense out of a desire to self-protect and to avoid regret. We also fall into pretense in order to belong and be members of a community. And at least in the space that I create, the one that you've given me the privilege to sort of lead or foster, I'm not about that. You get to be however you are. It's okay with me if you write me and say, we used your products, they weren't a good fit. It's okay if you tell me you're putting your kids in school. I won't judge you if you gave up on your vision because what I think we all need more of as parents and as home educators is permission to take risks and to find the good that works for our families and for us. That's what we need. In fact, isn't that what we want for our children isn't that what we want to give them? So without further ado, let's go for it. Let's talk about this really hard topic. So one of my moms, I call her my mom. She's not mine. She's my friend. Uh, she's actually a customer, someone I met years and years ago on one of those homeschool email lists. 
and she um, became a Brave Rider customer. Her kids have all taken our classes. She's used every single product. We've email exchanged for years because we're peers. Our kids are about the same age. And her kids had great success with my program and I absolutely love her children. I got to teach many of them. She sent me an email in August or the beginning of September saying that she wished I would write a blog post about regret. She told me that now that most of her kids are grown and she only has one or two left, she sees all these amazing opportunities that homeschoolers of today have. And she looks back and she regrets that she didn't successfully impart certain values or that she didn't have the opportunity to use these tools. She wondered, what do we do with that? How do you get over the feeling of regret? And what do we do with those missed opportunities? Someone says it's frozen. It's not frozen on my end, so I'm gonna assume it's still going. Try clicking out and coming back in. Sometimes that works. Yeah, and thank you for tapping the screen with hearts. I do appreciate it. So I'm gonna keep going. So here we go. There are two aspects of regret, two key conditions of regret. And I'm going to get to those in 30 seconds. But let's first talk about regret as a concept. Thanks, everyone. You know, everyone has regrets, except me. I decided early on that I would not have any regrets. And so I set about the process of becoming the first person in the history of the world to make it through adulthood without regret. That was my mission. I took it on with full sincerity, and I actually believed it was possible. I thought through the sheer force of my will and delightful personality, I would avoid all the missteps of my parents and those people I didn't agree with. <laughs> and I would make solid, right decisions from the start so I wouldn't ever have to look back and think, gosh, I'm really sorry I did that. That's how I began my adult journey. And then I got married. <laughs> and within a week, I had regrets. Only I wasn't allowed to have regrets because I was going to have a life without them. So I very quickly reassigned the feelings I was having. And I decided that I was going to live into this new reality and accept it on its terms so that I would never have to regret it, which is just double speak for saying I was going to pretend that I wasn't regretting anything, just in case you missed that. <laughs> I thought I better make it clear that's what was going on. But you know, I was 22. What did I know? But that was my goal. Regrets I discovered were unavoidable. And they were also, it was a ridiculous objective. The longer I got into this thing of adulthood and parenting, the more they mounted. I remember very early when Noah was still pretty much of a newborn. He was maybe six weeks old. You know, my husband at the time and I were traveling all over California itinerating. He was literally two weeks old when we flew home from Morocco. And then we got in a car and we drove house to house, church to church for an entire summer with a brand newborn. Like, are you kidding me? What, who would do that? Only crazy people. I was a crazy person. So... <laughs> We get in this car and we're driving to a family reunion and I'm exhausted. I haven't eaten. I'm postpartum. I'm also still recovering from jet lag. I'm staying in all of these different houses. And all of the sudden, I'm out of milk. Like my breasts, no milk. The dairy is dried up. And Noah was hungry because he's a baby. <laughs> So I'm trying to nurse him. I'm trying to calm him down. He's screaming his head off. I'm meeting new relatives for the first time in my life. And we, I finally take Noah to a bedroom where I am exhausted and emotional and have no way of comforting him. I didn't believe in bottles. So I have this ideological perspective going with the need to nurse, with the desire to be a great wife and the need to meet all these new people. And Noah was screaming. And I remember patting him on the back and all of a sudden, I hit him once harder than you need to. Like, I was so frustrated, I gave him kind of a hard smack on the back. This is a baby. And then I burst into tears, and I felt like a terrible mother. I don't know if any of you have done something like that, but I have. 
And that's when I knew I wasn't going to make it through adulthood without a regret. I was going to have to hold my choices differently if I was going to make it. Everybody hits that tipping point in their own relationship with their children. And if you homeschool, you're hitting it more than the ones who put their kids in school. Why? You have opportunity they don't have. You have more responsibility than those public school parents have. You are going to hit your tipping point and you are going to do things you regret. Regret, if we personified her, I would call her a total brat. <laughs> because here's what happens. You look back at a moment like that, where you smacked a baby, or you shouted and shamed a child, and suddenly regret is in your ear saying, get in the time machine, go back, fix it, psych! And you realize, I can't go back. I can't fix that. That's not possible for me to fix. It's over. I've done the damage. The damage now lives in my newborn or the damage now lives in my six-year-old. So regret gets you in this no-win situation, this cycle. And have you ever noticed if, if you are in a deep cycle of regret where you feel the pain of what you've caused somebody else at that core level, suddenly now you are distracted from the very life that is right in front of your eyes, the life you could change. And instead, what you do is you create new regrets because you're not present to your current life. Have you ever done that? So you're over here stewing about what you haven't done for your child while right now is going by and you're not doing anything different or new for your child. And so I call it the cycle of regret. Regret actually um, begets regret. <laughs> A nice little rhyme, right? Regret begets regret. It's this no-win circumstance. I like to say that regret isn't productive, but that's not entirely true. Occasionally, regret calms down. She stops nagging you, and all of the sudden, you hear a whisper. It's a tender call to account. Regret gives you a tender call to account. And this is what it is. She whispers how it could be different, not then, but now. Not then, not back then, but right now. And if you can hear it, if you can hear that whisper, you will receive illumination and healing at the knees of regret while you sit at her feet while she is explaining it to you you will get to see a different perspective and make new choices but it takes so much courage to do that because the second you make a new choice what are you doing does anyone know what happens if you regret something you finally are patient enough to understand what you did that you regret and now you have an opportunity to do differently what will you be saying about yourself if you choose differently than what you chose before? You are taking a risk. Yes, you are owning it. You are invalidating the previous choice. Yes, I blew it before. Exactly. I screwed up. I'm admitting that I was wrong. Whenever you admit that something you did in the past was wrong, you're actually invalidating a choice. And nobody wants to invalidate choices, particularly if they are these ideals that you hold so sacred in your life. Who wants to say, well, this choice I made is a wrong one if it matched an ideal I had? That's the scary part about regret. This is why we are so afraid to feel it, because suddenly we're facing our own limited understanding and we don't want to live from that. We don't want to look back and feel like, wow, I wasted 10 years. Or wow, I've caused damage. We don't want to face that. So there are two kinds of regret that I want to talk about today. And I made very limited note cards. But there are two kinds. The first kind is the regret of what I didn't do. What I didn't do. 
These are sort of the sins of omission, right? The stuff that we didn't do. Yesterday, I shared a periscope called 55 Things I Didn't Do as a Homeschooler. I could regret any number of them, some of them, all of them, but mostly I don't today. While I was living the life of a homeschooler, I did actually regret some of those even as they were whizzing by. And if you want to watch the replay on the 55 things, you can go to catch K-A-T-C-H dot me slash Brave Writer and you'll find it. Already it has over 300 views and it's only been up for a day. I think it struck a nerve. But here's the thing. We regret what we didn't do because we are finite, limited beings. We're finite. We're limited. And we're human beings. We can't know everything. We make choices based on our best understanding in a particular moment that is being warped and woofed by our own brokenness, our own need to self-protect. Sometimes we choose mates, we choose homeschooling, we choose to have five or eight children, and we think it's for this set of ideals and aspirations, and really it's healing a loss from childhood. It's meeting a need. So we can't always recognize when we're making choices the mixture of our own humanity that is creating the conditions that will eventually lead to regret, right? Yes, we certainly make mistakes. Everyone does. But here's the thing. Here's the second part that I want to talk about. So one of the ways that we talk about mitigating this limited view of life and our inability to do things perfectly, we say things like, Okay, well, let's all talk about the ways that we are not perfect. And so I'll see like blog posts and periscopes now um, and tweets about, hey, let me show you my messy laundry room or, hey, you don't have to be perfect. You can use paper plates or, you know, it's okay if you don't have a schedule because none of us have schedules. And we try to take some solace in the fact that we can't all do it perfectly. And we do take solace in that. That's not a wrong thing. But here's something I remember, and tell me if this is true for you. So back when I was in the early days of homeschooling, one of the vaunted leaders was sending out a magazine. This is before the internet. Um, and every month, every quarter it would come out and she would share you know, a whole bunch of information and we would just eagerly await this. And she just seemed like she had it all together. She had written several books. She had eight or nine kids. One of her kids was even special needs and she's running this whole big massive operation. You know, we were all in awe of her. So one of the times she posted in this, uh, posted, published in this magazine, a photograph of her laundry room. And it was predictably a disaster. There was laundry everywhere coming out of the seams. And all these people wrote to the magazine or wrote to her. They had posted, you know, oh, how reassuring it was that they knew that there was this mogul of homeschooling with a messy laundry room. But you know how I felt? I felt, oh, I, I don't want to know that. I, I want to master the laundry. I don't, if my leader can't master the laundry, what hope is there for me? I actually was not inspired or reassured. I was disconcerted. Has that ever happened to you? It's what I worried about yesterday. I thought, if I tell you the 55 things I didn't do, some of you might be comforted, but some of you might be like, are you kidding me? If Julie can't do those things, how ridiculous. I mean, I'll never be able to. And what's the point then? Why are we even trying? It's not even possible, right? The reason is we aspire to success. We don't aspire to relief from success. We actually want to be successful. We want to know how to do it, not just how not to do it. Yes, we want to see people being real. I'm all about being real. I mean, I think you know that by now. And I even liked it that this, you know, heavy hitter homeschooler was open enough to show me her laundry room. I do like that. But I want to also recognize that sometimes it's disconcerting. It's like, well, what does it take to, su to succeed? How do we know? Yes, there you go, Leslie. That's perfect. We have a hard time separating success from perfection. You have nailed it. That's exactly where we're going. 
because this is the situation. Regret is often about not just succeeding, but perfection, achieving the ideal. What we're talking about in this lecture, in yesterday, in all of the scopes I do, is that we get to be human beings with a vision that is imperfectly achieved, but can be achieved. I want you to know that homeschooling and running a family and managing a household is actually possible. You can do that. Will you make some missteps? Absolutely. Will you say some things to your children you wish you could stuff back in the silo and not have said? Absolutely. Will you learn things about yourself and your marriage and your family that are so disconcerting you are knocked off of your own sense of self? Yep. But that doesn't mean that you can't also come to the end of your homeschooling journey and look back with pride, with satisfaction. Regret wants to rob you of that moment, that moment of satisfaction. It wants you to be picky and to go back and say, what I did wasn't good enough. I don't get to enjoy the end result, or I don't get to enjoy today, or I don't get to enjoy my vision. That's what regret in its bratty form does. So let's keep going here. I remember I was training for a marathon last uh, last April with one of my friends. I do run marathons and this was going to be my fifth marathon and we got all the way into the training. I think we had just done our 16 mile long run and I suddenly had some kind of an ankle foot issue going on. So I signed up for physical therapy and we started working on that with the intention of getting me to do this marathon. And the week before the marathon, my small intestine ruptured and I was in emergency open abdominal surgery that night, a week before the marathon. Obviously, didn't run the marathon. And one of the things that happened to me is that I regretted not running the marathon. Now, why? I have no power over my ankle. I had no power over my rupture. And yet, even though I had no power I walked around in my heart of hearts all summer feeling sad that I didn't get to do that marathon, wondering if there was a way I could have somehow figured it out. Don't you do that too? Even when it's outside your control, you can have regrets. So I wanted to remind you that not all of the things we regret are in our control even. And in fact, even some of the things we think were or are in our control are not. We're dealing with other human beings. And other human beings have choices and impact the choices we make on their behalf. So as you are examining your regrets, keep in mind that some of this is just, you know, nuts. You're actually indulging an emotion that doesn't correspond with reality. Regret then, in my opinion, is partly about coming to terms with our limits. And I would like us to change the language around regret to grief because grief has stages. Grief is something you can work through and let go. Regret is different. Regret is I can get in the time machine and go back and fix that. But grief is it's gone and I'm sad. That opportunity no longer exists. I'm sad about that. I wish, I wish. Do you guys know that song from um, Into the Woods? I wish more than anything. You know that song? It's like that. You're looking back. I wish what might have been, but it's grief. It's not regret. And so the first place I want you to start is right there. We're grieving our own humanity. We're recognizing that we aren't superhuman. We're not omnipotent beings. We don't have all the insight available to us when we make our choices. In fact, some of the insight that we come to as a result of regret is the pristine gift, <laughs> the thing that we deserved, that we couldn't have come to 
without that errant decision. So sometimes that is the gift that in regret we got the illumination. I was listening to Elizabeth Gilbert a few nights ago on Periscope, oh my gosh, how fun is that, at her book tour. And one of the things she told was a story about Ann Patchett, and um, I think it's also on one of Liz Gilbert's Big Magic Lessons podcasts when she interviews Ann, so you could hear the original there. But Ann Patchett is a novelist, and when she writes a book, this is how she describes her process. She gets an idea. And the idea comes to her almost like, oh, you know, divinely inspired almost. And it becomes this amethyst butterfly, this beautiful fluttering butterfly that follows her around for a month. She can see it and feel it and hear its whispers. And the fantasy of this story lives in her imagination in all its complexity and beauty. And she lets herself enjoy that moment of the book for about a month. Then she has to sit down and write the book, and according to Anne, the first act she must commit before she types the story, she has to crush the amethyst butterfly. She has to kill it, destroy it, exactly. Because what she is about to do isn't the fantasy, it's the reality. She is now going to commit to paper. There is no option now for it to reconfigure and catch the light in different ways. She's going to commit one perspective to this fantasy. And that's us with homeschooling. Think about it. You spend the summer fantasizing how the year is going to go. It's this amethyst butterfly floating around you. And then all of the sudden, the year starts and you are killing the butterfly before you start. Because now you're dealing with reality. What you actually produce cannot be identical to the fantasy. And until we make peace with the fact that what we get is not identical to what we imagine, we will live in this weird juxtaposition of grief and butterfly, uh, grief and regret. You can love the pretty butterfly. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being in love with the vision. In fact, I would put it this way. You can't write the novel without the vision. You can't homeschool without the butterfly. That's the only thing that would give you the courage to take on such a big task is the fantasy. The hardest thing about what I didn't do is that we think it might have changed a current outcome. I want to say that again. We think to ourselves, oh, if only I had been more interest-led with my oldest child, he wouldn't be so truculent and resistant right now at a 16 years of age. Or we think, my gosh, if I had just been more ship -shape, if I had just required writing when he was 11, he would be writing now. Isn't that what we think? I used to say that I'm really, really glad that I homeschooled Noah because I think if I had put Noah in school, I always would have wondered, oh, he probably would have been a much better learner at home. But you know what? Noah as a homeschooled student was a challenge. He was a challenge. And fortunately, I found out that homeschooling wasn't a panacea. It just happened to work out better for him than school probably would have. But I would have always wondered that. And there were moments where I even sort of wondered, well, if I had forced him through the school system, might he have done things differently? Would he have been more prepared for college? And then I'd hang out with him for 10 minutes and think, oh, good, good Lord, no. <laughs> but I share that with you because that's a lot what happens with regret. We think, well, gosh, if I had just done it this other way, the current outcome that is unpleasant to me wouldn't exist. And I'm here to tell you, we just don't know. We don't know. We can't know. We can't know. We had the path in the woods that Robert Frost talks about, and there was a fork. And we took one way, and way leads on to way. And we can never journey back and get the other path. We can never get it back. And the path we're on creates the person we are. And all we can do is live into the reality and the beauty of that person. We ask ourselves questions like, 
uh oh, that child didn't get into college. It must be because he didn't learn math and it's my fault he didn't learn math. Did we forget that there's a will involved here in a child? Have we forgotten that some kids go to school and don't succeed? Are we unaware of the fact that not everybody is meant to take the same journey? That's what we have to understand. Our own process with our children is going to be variable and the outcomes are unpredictable. And yet we can still find joy. We can still find support for that experience for our kids. All right, let's keep going. So the second kind of regret, what I did do, what I did do. So the first kind is what I didn't do, but the second is even more difficult, more pernicious. It's not the sin of omission, it's of commission. It's the feeling that what I did has damaged somebody. And that is a scarier one. It still has the same two properties, and I'm going to bring those out so you can see them again. It's still a result of being a finite, limited being. And it's still built from the aspiration to succeed. We do things we regret because we're trying to ensure and shortcut success. And I say shortcut because usually the things we do that we regret are immediate. We shout to make sure everyone gets the shoes on so we can get in the car right now so we're not late to the dentist. We smack the back of a baby. We do something, you know, force them into tutoring, make them sit at the table for three hours to write two sentences. We do these things because we want instant success. We don't see it happening in a way that brings us security. So we dive in there and we are harsh. You know, I've done all of them. I remember with Noah, I don't even remember what the offense was. We banned him from the computer for six months. Six months! He was a kid, he was 12. Do you know, six months in a 12 year life is a really, 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 really long time. For a kid who is now going to become a computer programmer, that's ridiculous, ridiculous. Totally wrong punishment, totally wrong act, total violation of trust between our kid and us. We did that, I regret it, that's a mistake. I'm sure you have things like that, that you look back and you're like, I wish I hadn't done that. Here's the benefit though, of the regrets that we did versus the regrets of what we didn't do. If you did something, at least now you can repair it. You can do something about it. You can't do what you didn't do in the past. So let's say you wanted to be a breastfeeder and you didn't breastfeed. You can't go back and breastfeed that baby. You just got to move on, right? But if you did something that was unkind to your child, you can fix that. You can go back and you can repair damage. That's the wonder of being a human being. We can be sensitive. So I have a little formula, a four point step of how you can repair damage with your kids. And it's an apology process and I'm going to share it with you now. If you have friends who aren't on this scope and you're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, Joy really needs to hear this, share right now. Tap on the little Perry man and hit the share button. All right, are you ready? We're going to talk now about how we can repair the damage of what we did do. All right, here we go. There are four steps. Take a screenshot and then I'll talk about each one. Ready? Got your screenshots if you want it. And thanks for all the hearts and bats <laughs> and screenshots. And you can share on Twitter. If you um, take a screenshot, you can actually tap on the little share this on Twitter and it'll go right into Twitter. Okay, here we go. So number one, ask the child out for a coffee date or root beer floats. They're bottomless at Red Robin. Take them somewhere where you're alone and it's a nice setting. Don't do it while you're washing dishes or with other kids present or people hanging around. I want you to be alone with that child. And this is for something that you really regret, not something you did wrong today that was like off the cuff. I'm talking about that nagging thing that you know wasn't supposed to happen and did, okay? So the first thing is you need to be alone with this child. 
The second thing is you want to go belly up. I call it going belly up. And what I mean by that is you own your stuff. You make yourself vulnerable. You say, wow, I've noticed that I was exceptionally harsh in this area or I, you know, punished you in the wrong way, or I verbally abused you, or I told you you couldn't do X when you really wanted to, and I really should have let you, whatever that is, you know, or I didn't trust you, and yet you were trustworthy, or I called you a liar when you're not a liar. These are all things that you can apologize for that are real, that are real, and parents everywhere are doing them. I want you to know that you are not the only parent who has shouted and accused and prophesied doom and said things you regret. This is what parents do, even the good ones, which most of you, I would even venture to say all of you are. At least you have the heart of parents who want to be good parents. And that's the beginning. So you go belly up. How do you handle it when other people do it to your kid? We can talk about that in a minute, but right now this is actually about you. Let's focus on your relationship with your kids. So you go belly up and you say, I've been thinking about this and I regret that I did this to you. So the first is coffee, you're alone and you go belly up. The third one is, listen, now you're going to ask your kid, how was that for you? How was that for you? Can you tell me what happened when I fill in the blank, kept you off the computer for six months, ignored you when you explained what was going on, treated you like a liar when you were telling the truth? You ask for them to share with you how it felt and your only job is this. Oh, oh wow. Oh my gosh, I really feel that. Oh, I get it. Oh, I understand. My kids get uncomfortable when I get emotional, which I do at such times. So you're going to have to be very brave and learn how to rein in those emotions, practice with someone. And obviously some kids don't trust you enough to tell you their truths. Someone asked what age can you do this? Honestly, you can do this with a five-year-old. It's just the conversation will be different than a 15-year-old. And it'll go really fast with a five-year-old because they'll forgive you really fast. It takes longer with older kids because they really actually need the time to trust you again. You've breached their trust. You have to earn it back. And for kids who are very hardened or have been in a long pattern of mistreatment, they may just say, well, I don't know. No, I don't know. I don't have anything to say. Your job, receive it. That's it. Just receive it. Say, okay, that's fine. I just wanted you to know that that's how I feel. So what have you been listening to lately on your iPhone? What music is new? Can I hear what you're listening to? <laughs> what did you think about that one movie? Oh my gosh, are you following along on, you know, Doctor Who? That's what you do. You get it out there. You create space for them to share. You receive their sharing or you receive their not sharing and you move back into relationship. And the final step is, I'm sorry. You can simply say, after they have shared or not shared, say, well, I just wanted you to know I'm sorry. So that's the steps. Coffee date, go belly up describing, listen, and then apologize. Those four steps. That's what you can do for the regrets of the things that you did do and you want to repair damage. All right. Sometimes the impact of something you did lasts longer than an apology. When my parents got divorced, my mom sort of went AWOL for about five years. She's fine with me sharing this because we have a very healthy, good relationship now. But she was sort of missing in action from my life. And at a certain point through therapy, she recognized that. And she came back to me, I think I was probably about 30 or 32 at the time. And she said to me, Julie, I know that the effects of the divorce from when you were a teenager will continue to ripple out over the future of your life at various moments, even though I know on the whole you're fine. As those come up, if you ever need to talk to me, I'm here to hear your pain until I die. 
That's what my mom said to me. She's still living. <laughs> and you know, just the permission, just knowing that I could tell her if something was painful, that took away most of the need to ever talk to her about anything because I knew, I knew that she understood that there might be moments like when my children were born or I had to decide whose house to spend Christmas at that I would feel resentful that my parents were divorced. And by creating that space for me, I actually didn't really ever have much to say about it to her and we're very close. Now, I know that some kids are haranguing. So you've done everything you know how to do to belly up and make things right. And your kid now uses whatever this thing is as a battering ram when you are down. And so I've talked with therapists about this. And one of the things that you can say, I'm going to read it because it's too hard for me to remember it straight up. But here's something you can say to the child who's having a hard time letting it go. I know that you still have a lot of feelings about X. I want to hear them, and I'm glad you've shared them with me. I can't let you be abusive to me, though. When you are ready to talk to me about X without attacking me, I'm here, and I will listen. So giving space for your child to share their pain is not giving a permission slip for them to mistreat you. So those are the, that's the tension, that's the dance. You want to create space for this person to share their pain, but you also want to be self-protecting enough to know that you won't receive abuse, okay? So that's the balance. The last thing I want to talk about, and we've got, you know, we're already 45 minutes in, um, and here it is. Here are the lessons of regret, if we allow them. If you let yourself look back at the regrets that you experience, you can change what you do now. So let's say you look back and you're like, I wish I had been more into literature when my children were small. I wish we had done more crafts. I wish I had been more into exploratory learning. Well, guess what? You can do that now for you. There's a little person inside your body that is suddenly alert to the value of literature or the value of crafts or the desire to chase down, you know, astronomy. You don't have to have your children as an excuse to be a part of those now. So if your regret is teaching you a style of learning that you wish you had done with your kids, maybe it's just serious study with narrations and books, and that sort of t makes you tingly to think about it, maybe you're supposed to be in grad school. You know, maybe you're supposed to go to college and get your nursing degree that you never got when you were 18 because you were knocked up. Maybe that's what's going on with you. This adventure of learning you've had with your children, the regrets that are stirred up in you aren't really about your kids. Maybe they're about an unlived life that you get to have now. And I say, have at it. That's one of the fruits of homeschooling. Someone says, this is where grandkids come in. Well, absolutely. I know people who've absolutely used their homeschool experiences with grandchildren, but you don't need children as an excuse necessarily. You can do this for you. If what you wish had happened with your children isn't something that particularly interests you, then what you're looking at now is an outcome that you're unhappy with. So let's say you feel like, oh, it would have been so great if I had used this one program with my son, and it's not really a program you want to use as an adult. It may simply be that you're just disappointed in who that child turned out to be. And you're thinking, well, if I had done it differently, he wouldn't be this kind of person. But that's who he is. So at that point, this like deep acceptance of reality is your ally. You don't want to be the mother who every time the son comes home for Thanksgiving is a nudge, is saying, so have you got a job yet? Have you put out your resume? Are you going to marry your girlfriend that you've been with for four years? Are you going to stop smoking pot? I mean, do you want to be that mother? I don't think you do. In fact, I remember one time I was at a homeschooling mom's support group meeting and we were all out for ice cream. We were in a great big circle. It was really fun. We did this after all our homeschool support group meetings. 
and somebody brought up a complaint about their own mother. And for the next, I don't know, half hour, everyone was complaining about their mothers. Oh, she's such a nag. Oh, every time I go home. Oh, she doesn't understand who I am today. And I listened to all this. We are homeschoolers, mothers, right? And it got to me, and I said, you know, I am just listening to all this, and I happen to have a good relationship with my mom, but I am wondering, are our children going to talk about us like this in 20 years to their friends? Are they going to be like, oh my gosh, my mother's such a nag. Oh my gosh, my mom is always scrutinizing me. Oh my gosh, my mom won't let me grow up. And it was a moment, like right in that group, everyone kind of like, <laughs> because the truth is, no one wants a mother like that. And I don't want to be that mother. And I don't think you want to be that mother. And that starts today. That starts with profound acceptance today. Years ago, I used to listen to Dr. Laura before she was syndicated. And a woman called in complaining about her mom. And Dr. Laura said to her, well, what's she complaining about? She said, she's just really upset that I'm a full-time breastfeeder. She just doesn't understand that it's enough nutrition and I can't get her off my case. And so Dr. Laura responded and said, well, she's just worried about you. And she says, yes, but you know, I would never do that to my child. I, you know, I'm a stay-at-home mom, I'm a nurturer, I'm a breastfeeder, and she goes through this long list. And Dr. Laura says, well, what will you do if this child, this daughter, grows up and decides to get a full-time job in bottle feed? Silence on the phone. <laughs> and at that moment, this woman had the realization. Part of what we do is we judge our children as adults, and then we're resentful of it. And we need to recognize that our adult children get to make unique decisions for their lives, not all of which we approve of not all of which we approve. <laughs> There's the correct grammar, right? So we want to practice now with some acceptance, some tolerance, some curiosity. That will help us with our regrets. Regret teaches us that what we used to settle for no longer works for us. That's another one. We might suddenly recognize that we've grown because that's what regret shows us. And part of what I try to do now when I look back and I'm wistful about something that I didn't do is I think, well, look who I am today. That's pretty cool that now that thing that I wouldn't have even noticed before appeals to me now or that I'm mature enough and wise enough to appreciate something that I was insecure about before. That's another way to look at regret. It teaches you that what you used to settle for no longer works for you. And then number four on that list, regret reminds us that we are growing and evolving human beings. We get to grow. We don't have to be fixed on one system for our whole lives to prove that that system was right. It's okay to cling to something early because it's appealing. It's the shiny butterfly. It's the ideal. And then to outgrow it and recognize that a new season demands a different set of ideals and a different set of principles and to be okay with that. One of the reasons we aren't okay is that our communities judge us because people who are attached to the ideal for dear life are afraid you might find life somewhere else and invalidate their ideal. Just let it go. Just let it go. It's just a developmental stage of adulthood usually people in their 30s and early 40s, <laughs> but it's true. Let it go. Let other people evolve. Let other people not evolve. Both are going to be a part of your community of friends. And then number five, the last point on lessons of regret. Quite possibly, regret shows us that though we were sincere, we may have been wrong. Regret can teach us to hold our current certainties with less hubris and more humility, knowing that when we know better again, we will evolve and grow yet one more time. I'm going to just read that one more time at the end here. Regret can teach us to hold our current cer certainties with less hubris and more humility, knowing that when we know better again, we will evolve and grow yet one more time. What we regret 
is not going to be the same as what other people regret. And sometimes the choices we make, someone will point out and say, oh, don't do that. I really regretted it. You don't have to listen to that, just like they don't have to listen to you. What we want to offer each other and what I hope we're creating in my communities that I help, you know, facilitate is space for adventure and risk taking, space to grow, space to be right, space to be wrong. That is the journey of being a human and a homeschooler. So I'm here now to take a little bit of questions. I've seen a lot of people come in and out, and I'm very happy to have replay viewers as well. Thank you for watching the rebroadcast. I look forward to interacting with you in all the spaces I exist. Um, and I want to tell you before we go that my coaching community, CoachJulieBogart.com at the Homeschool Alliance, is really growing. It's booming since Periscope. And we have so many great conversations going on there right now about parenting, homeschooling, and becoming a whole healthy adult person that if you need more than just Periscope, just sign up. You're going to love it. It's fantastic. Um, and then the other thing you need to know is that our little oops, $15 off sale for Brave Rider ends on Halloween. So if you want to get any of our products or my new DDD set, the second shipment finally came in. Do it before the 31st, okay? And don't forget this creepy code. <laughs> all right, so that's all my, you know, stuff. And I already showed you, for those who weren't here at the beginning, we're going to discuss my book, A Gracious Space, in November. So if you want to buy a copy from Amazon, Julie Bogart, A Gracious Space, do that. And then we'll be reading essays each day and discussing how to implement them in your life. And that's what I have for today. I'm going, I get to see A Death of a Salesman tonight, the play. I've never seen it performed. I'm so excited. So before I do that, any questions? Oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. This talk was hard. It took me all day. <laughs> Thought about it. Spent a lot of time really, really trying to drill it down. Yeah. Yeah. Is that religious? No, it is not. None of our programs or communities are religion specific. I like to create openness for all people. How would you deal with my family trying to protect their regrets? Oh, put their regrets on your kids. Great question. Okay, let me answer that. And that'll take me a minute. I'll be happy to do that. In fact, in November, we're going to talk about the quizzing relatives that always show up at Thanksgiving and Hanukkah and Christmas. Okay, so we'll do that for sure. For family members who are nudges, who come in and try and take over and tell you how to do things, you need good boundaries. You can affirm the intention without receiving the interference. I'm going to say that again. Affirm the intention without receiving the interference. So you're going to want to say things like, I know you mean well for my kids, and I'm so glad you care about their education. Thank you for sharing your concerns with me. I'm going to take that seriously and review what we do. Thank you. And then you do what you want to do, okay? That's what you do. And you may need to set a boundary like, remember we talked about this, and I heard what you had to say, and I just, I made a different choice. Thanks, though, for sharing. And that's, you have to be firm. You have to be firm. <laughs> oh, you are welcome. Thank you for sharing that you like these Periscopes. I love Periscope. This has been my favorite thing I've done in my company, I think, all 16 years. And I'm super happy. Yeah, someone said I'll have to practice that first. You will. Do some paired sharing. You know, get another homeschooling friend and do a fake dialogue. We used to do this all the time in acting class. Get two people together. What about the insecure types like me are constantly second guessing themselves? You need community support. Join the Homeschool Alliance. People who second guess need to be around other people who give them space to really know their own mind. You can't know your own mind when you are of two minds. It's why I go to therapy. It's why I like being in community. It's why I read books and authors that I value because I don't always know what I think. I have to be able to interact and get feedback on my own thinking. My therapist says it like this. You've got this brain that's doing all this stuff and you can't see it. It's like in your head and you're like this. You can't see it. 
It's not until you do this and you get it in front of you and you look at it and you're like, oh, 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 that you can make choices. But if it's up here, you don't even know it's there. It's like you need someone to point that out and help you. Oh, I'd love to do a scope on books and authors that I like. Absolutely. Yeah, so I am. I'm a huge advocate for therapy. I go to Al-Anon. I love 12-step groups. I think it's invaluable. What if you are living in regret? How do you figure out what to do to move out of it? Well, remember at the beginning, I shared that regret is really sort of a pseudonym for grief. It's grief at loss, loss op opportunity, lost um, possibilities, lost outcomes. It's, it's a grief process. So the first thing you might want to do is simply journal. Get it externalized. Get it out of your head so you can look at it and give yourself the opportunity to just take in the loss. Cry. Grieve it. You can even schedule your grief. I know you're really busy, <laughs> but this really worked for me when I was going through a really, really, really tough grieving period. Um, I would feel it come on in the middle of the day while I was homeschooling, and I would tell my body, hey, I'm going to get back to you, grief. Tonight at 6, we're going to take a half hour in the bedroom and grieve. And then at 6, I would go in, close the door, and I would tell myself, you have permission. And then I would conjure up all the language in my mind that I knew would cause me to regret and feel sad and horrible. And eventually I'd start crying and I would give myself 30 minutes by the clock and I would sob my little heart out with my comforter <laughs> all by myself in my room. And when the 30 minutes was up, I was like, grow up, Julie, back to work, Julie. I had to do it twice a day for a while because one half hour wasn't enough. Eventually, I got it down to a half hour, and then eventually it went away. But if you're going through something really big, like your mother died unexpectedly, or you lost your marriage, you need that. You need that space. Oh, I see people having tears. Oh, God, love you. Yes, it's hard to journal with a baby, but um, if you can, you know, use the dictaphone on your phone. How do you protect your kids from your feelings? You're going to need to spend time in a space away from them so you have somewhere to process those feelings because it really isn't fair for your kids to be careful around you. That is actually not healthy for them. So you do want to figure that out. And of course, Leslie says you don't always have to hold it together. That's true too. Sometimes letting them see you in your emotions is perfectly appropriate. But I was picturing walking around in a depressed condition or crying all the time. That's not so healthy for kids. Would you agree, Leslie? Leslie, by the way, follow her. Leslie, type in so your name will pop back up. Follow Leslie on Periscope. She does come from a Christian perspective. But she is brilliant as a therapist and talks about marriage and family in her scope. So tap on her name right now, and then you can follow her and um, hear her scopes, you know, if you share that perspective. If you don't, that's okay. Um, but she is wonderful. She's a good friend. We were sorority sisters in college, and I love Leslie. <laughs> Um, any other questions? I think I need to go. <laughs> yes, actually, I do need to go. I've got to get to my play. So I'm going to hang up now. Oh, my yard looks so pretty. I haven't even been watching. I've been staring at the, you know, camera hole. But wow, it looks pretty back there with the light filtering and all the hearts going up. Thank you. I hope you have a great weekend. I'm going to try and scope on the uh, 55 things I did right in my homeschool this weekend, either Saturday or Sunday. So I'll catch you then so that we can, like, actually celebrate something good instead of all this grief and regret and ah, la, 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 you know. I had a great time homeschooling. I loved homeschooling. And I still believe in it. So we're going to talk about that too. All right, you guys. You Bye, Leslie, and bye, Rebecca, and bye, Eclectic, and goodbye, Little Red Brit, and SysTac. Thank you all for making these scopes so much fun and for tapping the screen with hearts. I love you. So I'm going to close with my tagline. You know it? Live honestly, write bravely. I'm Julie Bogart from Brave Writer. See you later.